I could run it. Sure. Okay. Well, now I, that I can't do. So. <laughs> All right. But no, the north side is that's no man's land.
Yes, you can applaud that, absolutely. Anyone who's ever played the piano, especially in public, you can applaud that because you know how difficult that can be. So wonderful job, Colleen. Thank you so much. Uh, and good morning. Good morning and welcome to every one of you, uh, those who are here in the sanctuary and those who are watching remotely from home today, either through Facebook Live or our YouTube channel or even American Broadband Channel 6. Uh, regardless of how you're watching, uh, whether it's today or even three days from now, we're thankful. Uh, we're thankful that you've chosen to spend some time with us uh, in worship. Uh, as we get started today, a couple of announcements uh, to share up front. Uh, you'll see some beautiful flowers here down by the pulpit. Uh, to my right, your left, and you saw some back on the table with our bulletins this morning. Those were generously donated uh, and given to us by the Grandquist family. Uh, as many of you know, Connie Grandquist passed away uh, a few weeks ago, and we uh, celebrated her life uh, on Friday. And it was a great opportunity for us to gather as friends and as family and those who know and love Connie and uh, just remember her and to cry a little and to laugh a little and uh, to remember a lot. And so uh, we do thank the Grandquist family for sharing that with us so generously. And if you would please join me uh, here right away in a uh, spirit of prayer, I'd like to pray for them. Lord, as we gather this morning on, on this Sunday, we, we have so much to be thankful for and so much to praise you for. And while we have great, wonderful, exciting things that happen in our life, uh, we recognize that there are, are things that occur that are, are less than joyful, that are less than exciting, and perhaps feeling less praiseworthy. Uh, but Lord, we, we uh, lift up this morning the family of Connie Granquist. We lift up Jim and Taylor. We lift up uh, her brothers and the rest of her family as well. Uh, Lord God, any time we lose someone that we love, we, we struggle with understanding why. And while we may never fully understand why you do what you do, we do know that all good things come from you. And so in these days, weeks, months, and even years, Lord, where the family and friends of, of Connie uh, come to uh, grips with her passing, uh, Lord, I just pray your hand of peace and comfort upon them. Uh, may we as the, as the church, may as we as the community continue to surround them in prayer and love as well. Uh, Lord God, we lift them all up to you this morning in the name of your Son. Amen. Also, as you know, we've been continuing to collect food during uh, 2021. Uh, hard to believe that the year is half over. You know, we're kind of on the, on the downhill slide toward the end of 2021, and we're still working to collect 2,100 pounds of food for the Wayne Food Pantry and the Backpack Program. So I'm curious, uh, I haven't given an update lately, I'm curious, anybody have a guess where we are here on July 18th? Uh, how many pounds of food do you think that we've collected since January 1st? 2,000. 2,000, 2, Do I hear another? Yes. 300. Okay, we have 2,000, we have 300. I like this. It's kind of like the price is right. You don't want to go over. You'll get as close as you can without going over. So 2,300. Any other guesses? Any other? You're like, I have, you're like, I have no idea. Well, uh, I'll tell you this. Brooks and George, you were on either end of it. So, okay, you were, you were both kind of close. Um, but not really. 1,947 pounds is what we've collected. 1,947. Now, again, the goal is 2,100. Uh, any math majors in the room? I kind of always look at George on this one, but I'll give him a break. 153 pounds is all we are away. Okay? So, basically, a, a, a stocky teenager is all that we have to collect to make the goal by the end of this year. Okay, gang? I know that we're going to make it. That, that's that's a, a non-issue, but uh, I just want to take a moment, give you that update. 1,947 pounds of food toward the goal of 2,100 by the end of this calendar year. Uh, gang, we're going to hit this goal. We're going to nail this. We're going to go beyond it because when we hit the goal, we're not just going to stop. We're going to continue. We're going to expand and stretch that goal a little bit, but uh, thank you so much for your continued generosity as we serve those in our community who really need some help filling their cupboards and their refrigerators. Now, all summer we've been focusing on the backpack program. Uh, the, for those who don't know, the backpack program at our local schools continues to uh, operate over the summertime, and uh, they find great need during the summer, as you might imagine. And so we continue to collect for that. So as you uh, are, are going through the, the, the grocery store or your shopping list, 
you know, if you think, gosh, I've got some room in this cart for those individual things of uh, macaroni and cheese or granola bars or applesauce or, you know, something that you might picture would go inside a lunch box, boy, toss it in. Um, we would sure appreciate that. But we are doing a great job as a church, so I'm excited to share that next update. Um, we'll probably do that on August 1st in two weeks. Um, I kept say, I've been saying since like March, we're going to hit this goal by August 1st. Now, I don't want to say I'm a prophet or this great thinker. Um, I'm really neither of those, but I, I really think that we're still going to make it. Um, so we, we appreciate that. You may have noticed as you walk in the fellowship hall, uh, as you walk in those first doors, immediately to your left, we've got something new on the wall. Maybe you've noticed it, maybe you haven't. Uh, we just installed this uh, about a week or so ago, and it's a prayer board. Uh, we, we hear prayer requests uh, in the church office uh, every week. You know, someone will call us or email us or stop in or even um, send something through the postal mail and say, hey, could you please pray for this, whether it's themselves or a family member or something in general. And, of course, we do that, and we'll sometimes send an email out to the church um, at that person's request. Uh, but sometimes uh, there are other ways that we can lift others up in prayer. And so what we have this is a great idea that was submitted. Um, it's, it's, it's a simple prayer board. There's a couple angels that are up on the wall with some strings and clothespins. If you have a prayer request, if you have something that you would like uh, to have somebody maybe praying for you, Stop in the office. Um, Deb will provide you with a piece of paper. You can write that prayer down. You can close pin it up on the prayer board. If you're walking through on a Sunday morning and you think, man, I just, it's on my heart to pray for somebody, check out that prayer board and take it. You don't have to leave it up there. You can actually take it down and uh, pray for that person. Now, if you want to bring it back and pin it back up a week later or two weeks later, that's perfectly fine. Uh, but we have this opportunity to continue to lift one another in prayer. Uh, now, you might have a prayer request that you don't feel comfortable pinning up there for all the world to see. Totally get that. Stop in the church office anyway. Deb will give you the piece of paper. You can, or you can use your own piece of paper, too. This isn't like special holy paper or pencils that you're using, okay? Uh, we just have the paper there. But you can write it down and just leave it in the office. And so if you're, if you're walking through and you're like, man, I really, uh, are there any prayer requests? Just pop in and talk to her. Deb can give it to you. You can take that and... Um, You'll pray for that person. Yes, sir, in the back. There's a notepad and pencil right beside the prayer board, Don said. So I must have missed that. I walked by it. Right on the side of the mailbox. Right on, oh, there you go. Well, I'll see. You've got to pay attention. Detail uh, orientation is not always one of my greatest strengths. So thank you. So, yeah, so there's a pad and pencil right there by it. So we invite you to um, submit your prayer requests in that way. Uh, we invite you to take prayer requests. And again, just one way, uh, another way for us to lift each other up in prayer. As I mentioned a moment ago, we are uh, on the second half of the year, and we are sliding into the fall, into the school year. Uh, that's kind of the unofficial start of, of the church year, you know? I mean, Advent is the start of the church year, and January is the start of the calendar year, but really in September, that's when we see activity in the church start to pick back up. Kids are back in school, we've got confirmation classes, Sunday school is rolling through. Uh, and as you might imagine, attendance in church sanctuaries starts to pop up in, in the fall. Well, by virtue of that, we need a few more volunteers on a Sunday morning. We've talked about this a little bit over the summertime, so I hope you've been thinking about this and praying about this. Uh, if you kind of feel it on your heart to share your time and your talent on a Sunday morning, man, we would love to find a way to plug you in. There's a lot of different ways that you can do that. They're listed in your bulletin, but just very briefly, you can be an usher. You know what? If you're really good at telling people what to do or telling people where to sit, that's a job for you because they have to listen to you, right? You're the usher. They have to sit where you tell them. But you can be an usher. You can be a tech booth operator back there. Uh, it's actually not as difficult as you might think it is. We've got instructions. We can train you. Uh, we can really get you rolling. So you can be a tech booth operator. You could be a fellowship host. We're going to re-implement fellowship time here in the fall. And so uh, we're going to start putting that tab in the bulletin like we used to do where you could sign up, tip it off, and put it in the offering plate. You know, you could be a fellowship host. You could be a Sunday school teacher. You could be a nursery person. You know what? There are just so many different ways that you can serve the church on a Sunday. And if you are available one Sunday a month, great. I'm not, we're not asking you to spend every Sunday serving. But if we have more people doing one Sunday a month, well then, fewer 
times that you, that you have to do it. So, uh, or that you get to do it, I should say. So anyway, we're looking for opportunities. Um, I would volunteer myself, but I got something going on um, during church, so otherwise I, I would sign up too. But uh, just let us know. Contact the church office. Fill out that tab once we start putting them in the bulletin, probably next week or the week after. And um, if there's a way that you would like to serve that maybe we haven't talked about, let me know. I am wide open to your ideas. If you have suggestions about things that we could do during worship that we're not currently doing, let me know. Uh, I can't guarantee that we'll, we're going to do everything, but talk to me. You know what? Talk to me and let me know what you're interested in. So enough of that. Uh, enough of that. Let's... Uh, uh, continue our worship this morning. Those are some fun announcements. If there's anything that's unclear, don't hesitate again to contact us in the church office and we'll be sure to get you clued right in. Now, as members of the United Methodist Church, we know that we are uh, called to do great things. We're not called to just uh, show up periodically and, and go home and forget about people. We're, we're called to really transform the world and make a huge difference. Uh, and one of the ways that we do that is through personal growth and development because as we grow, we can help others grow. And the mission that we have here at First United Methodist Church ties into that so very well. And so let's take a moment and share our mission together in one voice, whether you're here in the sanctuary or watching from home. The words are up on the screens and in your bulletin. But let's share that this morning. We are learning, believing, sharing, and growing in Christ's love for the transformation of the world. We grow, we develop, we go out into the world so that we may transform those around us. And there are so many ways that we do that uh, every single day. Let's continue with our opening uh, prayer today, uh, call to worship. It is listed in your bulletin once again, also up on the screen. So let's uh, once again share in one voice. I'll say the words that come after the letter L. You will share the words that come after the letter P. We come with joy to this celebration of God's love. Open our hearts, Lord, to receive your love. We come with hope to this witness to God's power. Challenge and encourage our spirits to serve you, Lord. We come with a willingness to proclaim God's presence to all. We thank God for this invitation to worship, witness, and serve. Amen. I invite you now to stand as you're able as we share our first two hymns this morning. Um, again, we will have the words up on the screen, uh, and Colleen will play. So let's gather together once again and worship in one voice.
Okay, so, okay, here we go. So you've done such, such a great job. We actually, okay, I have to be honest, this was all intentional. Um, this is all part of the larger message today. We showed the lyrics of one hymn and played the uh, tune of another to see just how uh, really strong the spirit was within this sanctuary. The people at home, they were like, yes, I feel this. I am on fire. And some of you, I could tell, were on fire as well because you were kind of doing this. Like your feet were, were, were burning. So here's what we're going to do as a reward for your incredible faithfulness and spirit-filled time. We're going to go ahead and have a seat. <laughs> we're not going to try to sing for a little while. And so I apologize. You know, here's, I'll, I'll just be frank. So I was in Proclaim last night. I was, I was adding some things uh, for the message this morning, and I, I fear I may have moved something around. I, I don't know. I'm going to take the blame either way. Um, so thank you for playing whatever you played. Thank you for singing whatever you, you, you sang. Um, I don't know what happened. I don't know, but it sounded good. You guys sounded really, really good. Do you want to do it again? No, no. no. okay, that's fair. Let's, I, I, re, I respect that. Um, so here's what we're going to do. <laughs> All right, gang, let's uh, just take a moment. Do you, Brooks? I tell you what, do you want to come up here and sing it again? He's like, oh, I'm not, I'm not committing to that. All right, so here's, here's the thing. This is a unique service today for those of you watching at home. Um, uh, I know this may come as a surprise to some of you. I am imperfect. I do make mistakes periodically. Uh, I just had you all sit down as a nice reward. I'm actually going to ask you to stand back up again um, to share the love of Christ with one another. Is that okay? Does anybody have a bad knee? Am I really aggravating someone's condition? I'm aggravating you, you and me both. Let's stand up, everybody, one more time and uh, share the love of Christ with one another. Thank you for your flexibility on this unique service, but handshake, high five, give a hug, whatever you want to do this morning. We extend the love of Christ to everybody who's watching us remotely today as well. I think we're back on track now. Are we back on track? I think we're back on track now. Uh, thank you again for your flexibility um, with some of my, my missteps. Um, for those of you who are wondering, my man here was asking, actually great questions, what these two boxes are down here. And if you've ever wondered, this box on the right-hand side, that's a humidifier, puts water up into the air. We're definitely not doing it right now. There's enough water in the air as it is. And this other, is, of course, you may know is a nice counter that we use sometimes for communion. We'll be utilizing more uh, that more often here in the fall. So uh, it's got some hidden compartments behind it, which is kind of neat too. So I appreciate you asking the question. Uh, friends, let's uh, continue our worship and take a moment and consider our gifts, tithes, and offerings. 
um, you know, as we uh, move through our life, we uh, are incredibly blessed people. Uh, but as we consider our gifts, tithes, and offerings today, I pray that we would remember that all that we have is not because of our own efforts. It's because um, of the efforts of, of a loving and, and merciful God. And so as we uh, consider those, those gifts, I, I pray that you would uh, think about that. That was we give back to God what once was his. Uh, there are a number of different ways that you can give here to the local church. Uh, those who are here in the sanctuary, we've got our offering plate in the back. Uh, you can uh, place your gift to either offering there before or after worship. Um, you can also send it through the mail. Uh, we have that happen often. That's certainly a great way to do it. Or you can give electronically. Uh, if you uh, choose to give electronically, there are a couple of ways that you can do that up on the screen. The first is you may text the amount to the number 84321. That's 84321. Uh, that is not the amount that you're giving, uh, unless you truly want to. That's just the number that you would text the amount to. Or you can go to our website, waynefirstumc.org forward slash giving, and then follow the steps for electronic giving there. But uh, regardless of what is given, regardless of how it is given, we are so incredibly thankful because what we uh, receive uh, here at the local church, we turn right around and we use it to serve our community. And so when you give, you are really giving to your neighbor. You're giving to the person down the street. You're giving to the person across town who you may have never met before. So as we consider those gifts, tithes, and offerings, I invite you to join me in a spirit of prayer. Almighty God, we, we are so thankful for all that you have blessed us with. Uh, may we remember that all that we have is not because of our own efforts or uh, because of our own um, cleverness or ideas. It, it's all because of how you have called us to be and, 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 and blessed us. So Lord, as we give back to you what once was yours, I pray that you would accept our gifts, tithes, and offerings in accordance with uh, the great sacrifice and gift that Christ gave us with his death and resurrection. Lord, we lift this up to you in the name of that Son. Amen. I invite you to stand once more as you're able as we share in our doxology this morning. So I want to take a minute and visit with our, our, our kids here, those who are here in the sanctuary and uh, those who are watching from home today. Um, i got a question for you. Have you ever, well, first of all, uh, I, I, I think I know the answer, but I better ask this question first. How many of you are in school? Raise your hand if you're in school. We've got couples. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we got some kids in school. Only one of you. Okay, work on that. Get the other one there. Um, okay, so you're in school, right? Now, so, okay, you can put your hands down. <coughs> Leave it to these three. So you're in school, and uh, you ever, like, uh, be sitting in the classroom, or maybe you go to the cafeteria, and you see um, this, this kid sitting all by themselves. They're sitting all by themselves. No one's eating with them, or maybe no one's sitting with them, or maybe on the playground no one is playing with them. Have you ever seen that? Yeah, maybe yes, maybe. I know I've seen that a few times you know, when I was in school. Uh, sometimes I was that kid, actually, who uh, was by myself at the lunch table or you know, in the library or, or on the playground. But the thing is, you know, we don't want those kids to be sitting by themselves. And sometimes when they're by themselves, it's because uh, other kids think, oh, well, I can't go talk to that kid. I can't go talk to that kid because he doesn't live in a nice enough house. Or I can't go talk to him because, you know, look at, look at the clothes that he's wearing. Or I can't go talk to her because, you know, she just, she's just a mess. The thing is, the, those kids that are sitting by themselves, you know, they still need friends too, right? They still need someone to sit with them and talk to them and show them that they matter, 
that, that somebody cares about them. And we're going to talk about uh, two guys this morning. Their names are Paul and Barnabas. I wish I could call him Barney because I think it's a really cool name. And it's a lot easier to say than Barnabas. But we've got these two guys who decided um, to go and kind of hang out with those kids who were by themselves in the cafeteria or on the playground or you know, in, in the library or something like that. And when they did, incredible things happened. Friendships were made, and people actually started to understand who Jesus is because they did that. And that's a chance that we have too. Not just to be friends with somebody, but to maybe show them what it means to be a little like Jesus. So as school starts up here, I've been talking about school a lot today. I got school on the brain. You know, but as school starts here in about a month or so, you know, just remember that you're going to be people who need us to go talk to them. They don't know it, but God is going to kind of touch your shoulder or your heart and say, I want you to go talk to this person. I want you to go talk to that person. And when you feel that, when you hear that in your head and in your heart, I want you to do it. Okay? Because um, they need our love and they need our friendship. So let's pray together. God, we thank you so much for being in our life. Um, we thank you so much when uh, we have people that we can hang out with, people that we can talk to, people that we can laugh with. But God, there are sometimes uh, people in our lives who don't have someone to talk to, who don't have someone to laugh with, who don't have someone to eat with. God, I pray that we would be the person to step out and be with them and show them that they matter and show them that we care. Because we know that's exactly what Jesus would ask us to do. So God, we lift up this prayer this morning. We pray for the courage to do these, these things. And we do so in your son's name. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes once it, Oh yeah. Man, just by the time I get this figured out, it's going to be fall again. Yes, Children's Church, feel free to step to the side. All right. You know, they say the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. I don't know what point kids learn that, but you know. I'm, I'm the same way. All right, our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 13, verses 13 through 16 and 44 through 47. Then Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. John, however, left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After, reading, after the reading of the law and the prophets, the officials of the synagogue sent them a message saying, Brothers, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, give it. So Paul stood up with a gesture and began to speak. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. And blaspheming, they contradicted what was spoken by Paul. Then both Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken first to you. Since you reject it and judge yourselves to be unworthy of eternal life, we are now turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have set you to be a light for the Gentiles, so that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand once more as you're able as we share in our next hymn, which I hope will be Go Forth for God. Um, but really, whatever is up there, do your best to make it fit.
may be seated. So we continue our walk through the book of Acts this summer, and we're focusing today on chapters 12 through 14. And there are a couple of stories that occur here in these three chapters, but the one I want to focus on most explicitly is the story of Paul and Barnabas and this first significant mission trip. Now, um, when I was younger, uh, back in college, uh, high school, I was a fan of the band Aerosmith. Any fellow fans of Aerosmith in here? Couple? All right. Special place in heaven for people, I guess. Um, now, back in, in May of 1997, uh, they hit the road for their Nine Lives tour, uh, the Nine Lives album tour. And I got a picture up here of kind of the concert, see if this laser pointer works a little bit. Uh, so this is not my concert tour shirt, but it's from the Nine Lives World Tour. And the next picture, if you look a little bit closer, there we go, Omaha, Nebraska is where they came. And so uh, this was uh, way back, uh, they started the tour in 1997 and ended in July of uh, 1999, so a little more than two years. And the tour uh, hit 17 different countries scattered over three continents. And of course, one of those North American locales was <coughs> Omaha, Nebraska. So uh, that came to pass about November of 1998, sort of in the middle of the tour. I was a college student uh, in Lincoln, and at the time, I had recently become interested in this girl who I had a few classes with. And uh, we really couldn't be more different, really. She was detailed and organized, and I managed some details. And organization was really more of a fluid concept for me, as this morning's events probably demonstrate. Um, but I managed to convince her to go on a date with me. Uh, now, she was a member of different organizations on campus, and she didn't miss a single meeting. Uh, she was very dedicated to that. I, I was kind of impressed by that. I was impressed by other things, but I was impressed by that a little bit, you know. Um, and the thing is, this concert was on a night of one of these meetings that was important to her. And so I, I thought, well, she's probably going to say no. But I went to her and I asked her, I said, hey, would you like to go to this concert with me? And she said, who's the concert? I said, Aerosmith. She said, Aero who? I should have just turned around and walked away at that point. But I gave her a CD. Uh, which, by the way, uh, a CD is a, uh, a circle yard a disc that used to have music on it. You'd go to the record store or the music store. You'd buy. Anyway, Kason, we'll talk about it later. But for those of you who know, you know what a CD is. Uh, this poor kitty's like, oh my gosh. Um, so she listened to it, and long story short, she said yes. She said yes that, that we should go. Now, suffice it to say, the concert was great. Uh, they were just prime form. I loved every song. And I must not have made too much of a dork of myself on that first date uh, because this uh, highly organized and respectable uh, young lady, uh, we just celebrated our 19th wedding anniversary back in June. So I don't know. I'm not going to say it wasn't Aerosmith that brought us together, but maybe it was. Now, the band played 200 venues in just over two years. Now, along the way, they almost certainly won new fans. Um, and along the way, they probably maybe sent a few fans away for one reason or another. And rarely, I think, did they really have an opportunity to decide where they were going to go. You know, there was somebody behind the scenes that would say, okay, you're going to go here, you're going to travel here, you're going to go there, etc. Sometimes it was determined by fans or, or interest or, or just plain demand. But sometimes the locations are selected because a band hadn't made inroads into a particular uh, community or a state or a city or maybe even a country. And by going in there, they kind of make a name for themselves and, of course, increase their exposure and ultimately album sales. So wh what in the world does the Nine Lives Tour of Aerosmith have to do with our message today? Well. Barnabas and, uh, and Paul, uh, Saul, so called Paul, um, are kind of like this band Aerosmith. When we pick them up in the story, they're in Antioch. Now, if you look, flip through your biblical geography, you're going to see 
uh, multiple cities with the same name. That's not too different for us. You know, there is more than one Wayne in America, although this is Wayne America. Amen. Uh, there are more, there's more than one Lincoln. There's more than one uh, Omaha even uh, in the city or in, in the country. Uh, and so Antioch is where they are, and it's in the country of Syria. And I just make that distinction because we're going to talk about another Antioch here pretty soon. And so Barnabas and Paul are in Antioch with, with others, and they're worshiping. And as they're worshiping, the Holy Spirit comes upon the group, and it says, Set apart Barnabas and uh, Paul for the work to which I have called them. Set them apart to the work that I have called them. And so those that were gathered, they, they, they fasted, they prayed, they laid hands on the two, and they commissioned them to go out. Now, the two didn't know where they were going. They didn't really have a say in where they were going to go, but they simply felt the call to go from the Holy Spirit. And so they went. So uh, let's see, I, I want to talk about a couple of cities. The next slide, so this is kind of a, a blown-up picture of the region. On the left-hand side, you see Italy, um, what used to be called Macedonia, that's now Turkey. Uh, to the right, we get into Asia Minor, and down along the right-hand side, we see Syria, Samaria, Jerusalem, etc. So this is kind of a, a blown-out uh, picture of the region. So as we pop to the next slide, then we're going to zoom in a little bit and look at all the different places that they visited. So they started off in Antioch in Syria, there on the right-hand side. And the reason why I wanted to show this map is because it's going to get really confusing over the next few minutes about all these different places they went. So they left Antioch and they went to Seleucia, which is just a little bit south. They hopped a boat and they sailed over to the island of Cyprus where they hit Salamis and walked across the island to Paphos. From there, they set sail for Perga and Pamphylia. So they kind of sailed upward there to uh, Perga and Pamphylia. From Perga, they went to Antioch of Pisidia. So there's an, it's a separate Antioch um, that they went to. And from, at this point, um, we're going to pause because they did hit Iconium, Lystra, Derby, etc. We're going to talk about those places in just a moment. But when you look at this map, this all total comprised over 1,500 miles. 1,500 miles of walking and sailing. And at each stop, they shared the gospel. Everywhere they went, they shared the gospel message at the Jewish synagogues. Now, while Barnabas and Paul were in Antioch in Pisidia, so they have worked through Seleucia, the island of Cyprus, they've gone back north, very at the, at the very top there, uh, Antioch of Pisidia. While they were there, uh, it was the Sabbath, so they went to church. They went to the synagogue, and uh, as part of the, the synagogue's teaching, they taught the law, uh, the Hebrew law. They taught the, the words of the prophets. Um, if you're wondering, well, why did they just focus on you know, the Old Testament? Why didn't they say anything you know, from the New Testament? Well, because they're living the New Testament. They didn't have a New Testament at that point. And so after the reading of the law and the prophets, uh, the service was done, uh, the worship experience was done, and people were leaving. But... As they were getting ready to leave, the officials of the synagogue asked Paul and Barnabas if they had anything they would like to share with those who had gathered. So people knew who Paul and Barnabas were to a degree. You know, people are starting to know about these guys and, and why they're, they're traveling around. And so Paul gets up, and he shares kind of a history lesson with everybody who's present. He begins with the story of Israel's captivity in Egypt. He's going to be hitting these key points that the people who are gathered are going to really understand. He starts with the captivity, captivity in Egypt, their release, how they spent 40 years in the wilderness. From there, he transitions into the nation's move into Canaan and how they uh, dwelled there for 450 years. He moves into a discussion of the prophet Samuel and introduction of King Saul, the first king that Israel had. Um, he talked about David's rise to the throne. And then Paul shares the connection between David and Jesus, the Savior. So what he's doing here, he's, he's making these little connection points. You know, as like all of you who are gathered, you know about the captivity. You know about spending time in the wilderness. You know about Samuel. You know about Saul. You know about David. All of this is working down to a certain point. And he makes the connection from David to Jesus. And as he makes this connection from David to Jesus, he talks about John the Baptist's message of the coming Messiah. 
Not just Jesus the person, but Jesus the Messiah. And then he refers to those who are gathered as descendants of Abraham's family. So if you see what he's doing. He's, he's telling the people who are gathered, all of you, you are all descendants of Abraham. And because the descendants of Abraham have followed this path from Egypt through the wilderness into Canaan, led by Saul, led by David, you are connected in this storyline with Jesus, the Messiah. Now bear in mind, these are people in the synagogue. They're not all on the same, in the same place as Paul and Barnabas. They're not uh, what you would call Christians. They're not uh, necessarily even uh, aware of this message of redemption and salvation that Jesus taught. So Paul's making these little tie-ins, these little connection points. It's kind of uh, marketing 101, if you will. He's showing how you are connected to this, how you are part of this. And so eventually he gets to this point where he says the promises that God made to Abraham were fulfilled in Jesus. So all the promises that you've studied and read about through the law and the prophets, they were fulfilled in this man Jesus. But here's the thing. You, and it's kind of the, the, the big you, not just the people in Antioch, but you as, as the Jewish community didn't believe him. You didn't buy into it. You had him crucified. But even in light of that, he rose from the dead. And because of that resurrection, his forgiveness and redemption is available to you. So even though you're part of this larger history, even though you may not have heard about this message, even though you might not have even uh, gotten on board with it, this man Jesus, who's connected to David, who's connected to Abraham, his sacrifice is for you. And all who believe that are set free from their sin. It's not the law of Moses that will set you free. It's the love of Jesus. So when the people heard this, they were uh, astounded. They were, they were amazed at, at hearing this. And so Paul and Barnabas were asked to return the following week, the following Sabbath, and share the message again. Well, needless to say, uh, word travels fast. And you know, people who were present told their friends, who told their friends, who told their friends. So when we get to the next Sabbath, the next week, Scripture tells us that nearly the entire city is present to hear what Paul has to say. Now, the local Jewish leaders were not impressed by this, as you might imagine. We, I mean, and this is, I mean, it's a recurring theme, isn't it? We saw it with Stephen. We saw it with Peter. We saw it with Philip. We've seen it with Paul and Barnabas now. The Jewish leaders don't like what's happening because how are these two yahoos from out of town getting all of these people to show up and listen? We can't get half these people to show up on a holy day, but we've got all these people showing up for these two guys who are, by the way, teaching something that is completely different than what we need the people to believe, what we believe. They start to feel jealous. And so what they do is they start uh, really contradicting what Paul and Barnabas are, are, are preaching. They start saying, oh, these are, this is blasphemous. Don't listen to these guys. They are turning you in the wrong direction. And so uh, Paul and Barnabas hear that, and they, of course, they throw down the gauntlet. They're like, we're, we're not going to play this game. And they say, um, since you won't listen... I mean, we came to talk to you. We came to send this message to you, to give you this gift. But since you won't listen, you won't pay attention, you want to ignore it, we're going to talk to the Gentiles. We're going to just shift our focus, and we're going to preach to the Gentiles. Now, the Gentiles are all about this, okay? The Gentiles, if you remember, they're, they're just kind of a collection of folks who are not of the Jewish community. And so, of course, they're in the same city. They're hearing these messages, and they're thinking, man, that sounds really enticing. That sounds very cool. I wish I could be part of something like that. And now they hear that this message is for them. They had been excluded from this message up to this point. This message of saving grace and redemption, of, of eternal life with their creator. They liked what they heard, and now these guys are saying, we get to, we get to be part of it. The Gentiles were definitely on board. Now, the Jewish leaders uh, were not going to give up. Um, they kind of riled up the influential men and women of the city, uh, community leaders, religious leaders, and they, they, they got them thinking that, okay, we've got to get these people out of town. Um, we, 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 we've got to stop what's happening. And so because of their efforts, Paul and Barnabas were kind of rushed out of town, you know, out on a rail, so to speak. 
But in chapter 13, verse 51, uh, John, uh, the apostle who wrote the book of Acts, he wrote these words. So they shook the dust off their feet in protest against them. They shook the dust off their feet in protest uh, against the Jewish leaders, and they went on to Iconium. Now I want to take a moment here and talk about this phrase, shake the dust off of one's feet. Why in the world does John take the time to talk about this weird phrase? Of course they shook dust off their feet. The whole country was dust. It was sandy, it was dirty, it was dusty. It, it's not just the physical act of shaking dust out of your sandals. It was symbolic. Prior to this time, very pious Jews who would uh, have traveled to Gentile communities, um, they wouldn't stay long. Which if, if you remember from last week's message, Peter and Cornelius, um, Peter says, hey, you know, the law says that Jews and Gentiles shouldn't be together. So pious Jews who would have gone into a Gentile city, as they left at the city gate, they would have very demonstrably shake the dust off of their feet. And what they're doing is not just getting the literal dust off, but they are figuratively showing that we are separating ourselves from you. Okay? We are separating ourselves from your practices. It's us and it's you. These don't come together. And so as Paul and Barnabas are, are leaving town, leaving a, 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 a Jewish community, they know, they know what they're doing. They shake the dust from their feet with all of the Jewish leaders watching, and they understand exactly what's happening. What Paul and Barnabas are saying is, we are separating ourselves from you, Jewish community. You chose not to listen. You chose to ignore. Um, we are the same, but we're, we're, we're not going to be part of what you're teaching. You're going to ignore this message of salvation and grace and mercy and forgiveness. We're not going to have a part of that. So they shake the dust from their feet, and they go on to Iconium, which is just to the east there. Now, briefly, they get the same treatment in Iconium. People want to hear their message. They share the message. The leaders don't like it. They rile up the folks and um, run them out of town. And so Paul and Barnabas flee to Lystra in Derby. And while they're there, Paul healed a man who was unable to walk. Now, if you, when you read the story, it's very similar to the, uh, back in chapter 3 when Peter restored a man who was unable to walk. It's almost a line-by-line a, a line, a repetition. And when this happened, people were so impressed, they thought, oh my goodness, these are not mortals. These aren't men. These, these are the gods. These are the Greek gods who have come down, taken human form, which was a common perception at that time. And so we need to, to glorify them. We need to bring offerings to them. We need to put them on a pedestal. And that would have, if Paul and Barnabas had allowed that to happen, that would have completely contradicted their message. They said, no, what is happening is not because of the power of Paul or the power of Barnabas or the power of anybody. This is because of the power of God. So they're still sending this message. They didn't allow the, the, the hype and the ballyhoo to get to their heads and say, oh, man, we're really something. We'll go ahead and take these offerings, you know, and th then we'll tell them who. No, no, they said, no, don't do this. And so they have developed this reputation of sharing the word of God. They've gone from community to community to community, from Derby. They go back to Perga uh, and eventually get back to Antioch there in Syria. This incredible journey took anywhere from one to two years to complete. They hit a lot of places, 1,500 miles, at least a dozen stops, hitting some of those locations twice. So why this, why? Why does this even matter? Why, why do we take the time to study this bit, this part of, of the mission? Because it brings out a very important message, two messages, in fact. One is that Paul and Barnabas went where the Spirit led them. If you remember all the way back to 23 minutes ago, Paul and Barnabas were worshiping with others, and the Holy Spirit came and said, set these two apart for the work I have called, for them, called them to. It wasn't their idea. It wasn't their direction. It wasn't their guidance. It wasn't their wisdom. It wasn't their suggestion to go to these places and share the gospel. It was the prompting of the Holy Spirit. 
And that's important to note because as humans, if we are left to our, on our own to decide to go do something hard, to do something that's maybe a little dangerous, to do something that's a little scary, most of us are not going to go, are we? I mean, there, are, there might be the, the rare person who goes, oh man, I, I laugh in the face of danger. I love things that are a little scary. You know, there's going to be that that person out there. But for the most part, we are not going to go somewhere that we know is going to be uncomfortable, that we know is going to potentially hurt, that we know is going to scare us. But it's the prompting of the Holy Spirit that moves them. And Paul and Barnabas didn't have a say in where they were going. They just went. And the Spirit led them from one community to the next. Even when they experienced danger, the Spirit brought them in. They, they were made aware of the plots against them. So Paul and Barnabas didn't go where they thought it was a good idea to go. If that's the case, they would have maybe hit uh, Seleucia and stopped. Because sea travel, very expensive. And very dangerous. Why do it unless they were called and led to do it? And as they went from one stop to the next, uh, new believers were added to their ranks. This message of the redemptive power of Christ, his forgiveness and his mercy and his grace begins to swell. More and more people are talking about it. Look at the island of Cyprus. It doesn't look that big, but I mean, it, it's a sizable island. Two main cities on either coast. Enough people start to hear about it. That entire island becomes believers. And they go from place to place sharing the gospel message each time. If you, if you kind of picture a, a, a bowl maybe with some water in it and you have some food coloring and you drop, put a little drop of food coloring on one side of the bowl, what, what, is, what does that drop do? It starts to spread. It starts to kind of dissolve and come through. So you put another drop here and here and here and here and suddenly as that food coloring expands and, and spreads out, you've got the entire bowl of water filled with color. That's what's happening here. It's, it's not an accident that they almost make a, 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 a full circle here. Because as the believers in these regions begin to grow, they start to spread out. Until eventually we've got this whole middle section and beyond of people who had not heard the word of Jesus before who are now hearing it. And not just from the Jewish communities, but now the Gentile communities. So the pair went forth for God. Not for Paul, not for Barnabas, not for Peter, not for Stephen, not for Philip, but for God. The second thing is that Paul and Barnabas shared the gospel with all who would listen. Okay, they started preaching to the Jews in the synagogues, and when they started getting the pushback and the blowback, they could have easily said, well, this isn't going to work. So we're just going to go to the next Jewish community and try our luck there, or the next Jewish community and try our luck there. No, they said, okay, we tried it here, we're going to open this door to everybody. Now, if you've got a community of 1,000 people, and let's say 6, uh, 600 of them are of the Jewish uh, culture and faith, and 400 are not, they're like, well, hey, we're going to open this door to you 400. Because guess what? This message is for you. It's not just for these folks over here. So they shared the gospel to all who would listen. They shared the gospel with everyone, and everyone equals anyone. Not just the people who had the right background, not just the people who had the right education, not just the people who had the right uh, social connections, not just the right people who had the uh, amount of money in the bank, not just the right people fill in the blank, okay? Not just the right anything, but for all people. They lived the Great Commission. When Jesus said, I want you to go to the ends of the earth, it wasn't the ends of the earth of the Jewish communities. Jesus knew it's the ends of the earth, period. They preached the gospel to all who would listen. Is the Holy Spirit prompting you right now? Maybe not in this moment, but in this season of your life. Are you feeling a prompting by the Holy Spirit to go forth? Maybe it's not to go forth uh, across the countryside or even internationally as Paul or Barnabas did, but are you feeling led to go, to share this gospel message to someone who would listen. You might be feeling that. 
If you are, I want you to lean into it. I want you to listen to it. It's especially key if you feel a prompting to send you somewhere where you wouldn't normally want to go. It's like Jonah was called to go to Nineveh. That's the last place he wanted to go, and he went the opposite direction. Maybe it's serving a particular community. Maybe it's serving a particular family. Maybe it's serving your own family. Something that might be difficult or hard. But when we go where the Spirit leads us, when we uh, act in the way that the Spirit calls us to act, when we preach the gospel to those who would listen, not just a specific group. You know, I have some um, other clergy, not in this community, but in other communities, um, sometimes ask me, well, why do you offer communion to people outside of your church? Why do you offer communion to people uh, at the Lutheran church or at the Presbyterian church or at the this, that, and the other? Because it's open for them. It's not just for the United Methodist Church. This isn't my table or your table or this church's table. It's the table of Jesus. And it's for all who would listen. Now, they're not being, you know, critical necessarily when they ask me those questions, but it's like, why would I limit this message? Why would I limit this opportunity to a small sliver? Well, I shouldn't say small. One sliver of the population. And, and neither should us. Neither should we. So I pray that in these days, in these weeks to come, as you feel the prompting of the Holy Spirit on your heart, maybe it's next month, maybe it's even next year, listen to that. Where is it calling you to go? Is it in the workplace? Is it in the community? Is it in the home? Maybe it's overseas. But may we all share the gospel of Jesus Christ to all who would listen. Because every single person is, is worthy of this message. Let us pray. Almighty God, as we, as we gather here this morning, we know that uh, these are stories that we know. These are messages that we understand. But Lord, we also understand that there are folks who have not heard this message yet. I pray that uh, as the Holy Spirit touches our hearts to go out, to go forth, to go where we are sent, May we share this redemptive message to all who would listen, not just to those who look, act, or speak a certain way, but to everybody. Because the love of Jesus is not limited to one population, but to all. Lord, we lift up this prayer this morning. We lift up those uh, who are feeling the call to go. And we do so in the words that your Son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to stand once more as you're able as we close our worship service this morning with the song, Pass It On. Uh, we'll do verses 1, 2, and 3.
So friends, we are called today, let's, let's pass it on. Let us pass on this message uh, of Jesus to all who would listen. Um, but may we go as the Spirit prompts us to go. May we lean into that message and that, that feeling in our heart that this is a person who needs to hear the Word of God. This is a community that needs to be served. This is a group of folks that we are here to care for. It won't be easy, but nothing that's really worth it ever is. So as we go from this place, may we do this as individuals and as a church. So until we have a chance to see each other again, either in the sanctuary or remotely, I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he bring you everlasting peace. Amen. Have a great afternoon. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you all next Sunday. Thank mm-hmm. you.